Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Get access to this month's Nebula Journal Club by signing up at the link in the description. One of the modern challenges that machine learning engineers have faced is that of power. No, not that kind of power, that kind of power. But what if we were to use this kind of power instead? That's right, some researchers are trying to develop neural networks using light, or more specifically, lasers. And if we were able to develop computing systems that only relied on light to train and apply models, it could change the field of computing as we know it. But what makes light so special, and how hard would it be to develop such an optical device anyway? That's what we're going to be breaking down today, so stay tuned. But before we can talk about lasers, we should probably talk about traditional computing. That's right, transistors. The things that power our laptops, phones, TVs, and make a considerable portion of our daily lives possible. In order to do anything from type up an essay on your laptop to watch a YouTube video to develop a machine learning model, you're going to need transistors which are used within computers to control and direct electrical signals based on the task at hand. Transistors started out pretty big, about one to six inch vacuum tubes when they came out in 1907, but over the years, researchers have worked to make them smaller and smaller so that we can fit more and more of them into our devices. In the process, scientists have created transistors that are smaller and smaller and smaller and, oh, wait, I don't think we can go smaller than that. And herein lies the problem. You see, there's this thing called Moore's Law that you might have heard of, which was an observation made by Gordon Moore in 1965. Moore was the co-founder of Fairchild Semiconductors and the CEO and co-founder of Intel, and over the years he'd watched scientists shove more and more transistors into computers. In fact, he'd noticed that the number of components that we were able to put into integrated circuits seemed to double every two years or so, because transistors kept getting smaller at the same rate. Well, the problem is that transistors are made of matter, and matter is made of atoms, and and so transistors can only get so small before Moore's law starts to fall apart. In fact, Moore and other scientists think that it will fail in 2025. And even now, with the advent of machine learning and other tasks that take a ton of computational power, we're starting to be limited by our computational resources. Giant models like GPT-3 show the power of having massive data sets and massive models, but they also require months to train in order to reach the point of being useful. This is also why the machine learning models that we tend to interact with on things like our phones are actually localized in the cloud. So when you use Siri, the model that you're using is personalized towards you because it's being trained partially on your own device, but the central Siri model is not on your phone because there's no way it would fit or be trained there. So with the predictions of Moore's Law's imminent failure, researchers began exploring and developing new tools for computation. This includes optical neural networks. But what makes light, or photons, better than electrons. Well, for one, light moves at, well, the speed of light. Using photons in optical neural networks means that we can perform the same computations that we would normally do on our computers much faster. Additionally, unlike electrons, photons can perform multiple computations in parallel without one computation interfering with the other one because they're also quantum particles. In fact, researchers have been trying to create optical neural networks for a really long time. This paper shows an optical neural computer performing pattern recognition in 1987. However, researchers looking to use optical neural networks to perform complex tasks, the types of tasks that we can currently perform using on-device machine learning on our laptops and phones, face several challenges. Their first challenge was that it was initially unclear how to train an optical neural network, or more specifically, how to perform backpropagation. When we develop traditional neural networks on our computers, the training involves two steps. First, you send all of your inputs through the network in order to make a prediction, and this is called forward propagation because you're passing information forward through the network. Second, you use the model error, which is calculated by looking at the difference between the predictions and the actual labels of your data, to send errors back and update the weights of your model. This is called back propagation because information then flows back through your network. Now, forward propagation within an optical neural network was relatively easy to figure out. You can just put in your input. If we're looking at that pattern recognition model, then you put in that picture of a tree and you see what prediction you get at the end. However, back propagation is a challenge. After all, in an optical neural network with fixed lenses, lasers, and mirrors with fixed characteristics, how do you update those characteristics to reflect the predictions that your model made? 
Much of the initial work on this challenge focused on application-specific machine learning models, where the final model wouldn't have to change in response to new data after it was created. In those cases, researchers modeled an optical neural network on a computer, taking into account how the photons would interact with the different parts of the model in order to create a prediction, and then optimized the parameters of those model before they actually made the physical version. Their device was then physically created and tested to make sure it worked as well as the simulated version. And an important part of these approaches, both in the past and now, were spatial light modulators, or SLMs. SLMs are objects that change characteristics of a beam of light as it passes through the object. And the characteristics of an SLM vary spatially within the object, so how an SLM changes a beam of light depends on where in the object the beam of light hits it. For example, those transparent sheets that were used in overhead projectors are spatial light modulators because they modulate the beam of light that's coming from underneath the overhead projector so that the words or drawings or figures are then represented on the screen. SLMs are useful in optical neural networks because they can serve as either inputs or weights, their parameters can be optimized in the original simulation, and they can allow the physical model to perform computations. In fact, more recently, researchers have developed SLMs that can change their characteristics in real time in response to optical signals, allowing researchers to perform backpropagation within a physical optical neural network without having to train the design on a computer. These are called programmable SLMs, and researchers can use sensors within the network to update their characteristics in real time. This is particularly useful because it lets us develop optical neural networks much faster, as training a simulation of the optical version of a neural network structure can take a lot longer than training just that normal neural network because of all the extra parameters that the model has to take into consideration. The second challenge that researchers faced was that of nonlinearity. As we discussed in my AI 101 series, part of the power of neural networks comes from the nonlinear activation functions applied to the output of each perceptron. These nonlinear activations help us build functions that would be otherwise very difficult to learn analytically. In fact, if we were to remove nonlinear activations from neural networks, the resulting neural network function would just be a linear function that you could get from a linear plot of the data, and which likely wouldn't be particularly accurate, especially if the data is particularly complex. Creating optical versions of activation functions proved to be particularly challenging in the early research. However, recent work has shown a lot of interesting approaches to creating these activation functions, including materials that change phase and quantum interference. For example, this recent paper uses phase change materials, specifically a material that transmits beams of light when it receives several simultaneous high power inputs and does not otherwise. This material could be compared to a rectified linear unit or ReLU activation function, which goes from outputting zero to outputting a value once the input reaches a certain threshold. And the authors of this paper were able to build a classifier model with multiple of these phase change material cells that could perform both supervised and unsupervised learning learning to identify numerical patterns in both cases. Another paper focused on using electromagnetically induced transparency, or EIT, to create activation functions. EIT allows otherwise opaque materials to become transparent due to quantum interference as long as the beams of light are tuned correctly. Now, I'm not going to get too much deeper into that here, but if you want to see me break down the quantum physics behind some of these papers, you can check out this month's Nebula Journal Club. And in this paper, the authors were also able to develop a nonlinear optical neural network. With the progress behind these two challenges, we've reached a point where optical neural networks can classify datasets like MNIST and are being applied to even more complex tasks every day. But here's the catch. You're not going to see an optical neural network on your phone or your laptop anytime soon. While classifying MNIST is certainly promising, there's a huge difference in complexity between tasks like MNIST and tasks like Siri. It's going to take a while, if we ever get there, to reach the point where we're making optical neural networks that can handle the types of deep learning tasks that we interact with every day. Plus, there's the issue of actually putting optical models on our devices. While the optical neural networks that we discussed in the papers today were all developed on microchips, they were all also relatively small two to three layer models. To scale an optical neural network from that size to the size of traditional deep learning models would require much bigger chips, which may or may not fit inside our devices and might also be more prone to error if the beams aren't perfectly aligned. You would also have to find a way to input information into the optical neural network and collect the photons that represent the prediction in a way that the rest of your device can understand. And while optical neural networks may be faster and more energy efficient than traditional machine learning in theory, 
In practice, they require high-powered lasers, which still consume a lot of energy. But if we were to get to the point where this works in a scalable way, the computational possibilities are endless. For the average person, optical neural networks would allow for on-device machine learning, which would create better personalized models without compromising your data privacy. Perhaps we'd even get to the point where we'd be able to train models big enough to start thinking about something like artificial general intelligence. In any case, we're a long ways out from that, and it's important to note that optical neural networks aren't the only method of improving computation that are being considered by scientists right now, so it'll be very interesting to see what new technology comes out of this and whether or not we'll have a new Moore's Law for these new systems. Now, I read a ton of really interesting papers in order to make this video, enough where I could make a whole separate video on the research itself. However, a video like that probably wouldn't perform very well on YouTube because it's on such a niche topic and people who come across my channel likely wouldn't be interested in it. That's why my creator friends and I teamed up to create Nebula, a platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and we can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about the history and limitations of electricity? Check out The Story of Electricity, a three-part documentary about humanity's quest to master one of nature's most mysterious forces. While CuriosityStream is all about big-budget non-fiction documentaries, we're building Nebula so that education creators have a place to try out content that might not work so well on YouTube. You'll find some of your favorite creators on Nebula, from Braincraft to Up and Atom to Medlife Crisis, as well as my monthly Nebula Journal Club, where I'll be doing those deeper dives into interesting papers related to one of the videos I did this month. You can watch the latest Journal Club, where we looked at a paper on storing information and building physical objects out of synthetic DNA, and stay tuned for the next one coming out later this month on Optical Neural Networks. You can also check out our Nebula Originals, like Tom Scott's game show Money, a series that takes some of your favorite creators and pits them against each other in psychological experiments where if they work together they can win some money, but if they work alone they can win more. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off the annual subscription, with Nebula included for free as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Clicking on that link really helps out my channel, so if you would like to support me while getting to watch my videos ad-free, you can sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the promo code JORDAN or at CuriosityStream.com JORDAN. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter in order to keep up with my PhD life, and I'll see y'all next Friday. Bye!